Hello, good evening everyone and a very warm welcome to this, the second meeting in our Cav Crop 2021 web webinar series. This meeting has been brought to you by SEC Consulting Livestock Team and SRUC Vet Services. The meeting is funded through the University Innovation Fund. Just a brief whistle stop tour through, we covered this on the first webinar on Tuesday, but for those of you who weren't there, the key goals of the programme are to extend those key research messages a, out from our research institutes to farmers to where it really makes a difference. We're trying to improve overall suckler herd performance, produce more calves and ultimately make you more money. So the team for Calf Crop 2021 this year is a two from the vets, so Tim Geraghty and Alwyn Jones. Tim spoke on Tuesday and Alwyn will speak tonight. And then from the livestock team, we have Karen Stewart, who's a nutritionist, and myself, Robert Ramsey. I'm a beef specialist and I'll be talking tonight as well. So uh, that's the team. And behind the scenes, we were ably assisted by Seamus, Val, Sarah and Leslie. So the format for this year's series is obviously a bit different. We're virtual and the webinar is actually it's been a really powerful tool to bring messages out or put messages out to farmers. We had our first meeting on Tuesday night, which was on setting up your herd for a successful calving. That's now available online uh, as a recording if you weren't here and want to hear more or want to uh, revisit it again. And tonight's webinar is on calving systems, looking to basically help your cows and help yourself. Um, so as I said, that's that's tonight's meeting, meeting two. And we have Alan Jones first, who'll be covering a management of environmental disease. And then myself, I'll be looking at systems, technology, and a bit on safety as well. So the important thing, really important thing for us all is that you do ask questions. So it's your meeting, and it's important that you can steer this meeting in whatever direction you want it to go. So we've got two formal presentations to start with that should be about roughly 20 minutes each and then plenty of time at the end for discussion. So please keep those questions coming, uh, stick them in the chat function or the, or in the questions function on the right hand side and Tim will deal with them at the, at the tail end of the meeting. So please keep your questions coming and without any further ado I will introduce you to Alwyn. Just share my screen. Hang on a second. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, can see that fine. Thanks. And you, you can hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Apologies. Okay. Okay, thank you, Robert, um, and good evening, everybody out there. Um, <clears throat> so, my talk is going to focus on uh, the health of the calf. So, following following on from what Tim um, spoke to us on Tuesday about the health of the cow, so I'm going to move on and talk about the calf. Um, and in particular, I want to focus on um, on the diseases that the calf can pick up from the environment and what we can do to reduce the risk of um, these diseases that are the calf picks up from the environment. And to start off, just a, a quick, um, I suppose, a reminder that there's a lot of different infections out there that the calf can can pick up from its environment, and um, that can go on to cause disease. And even even before it's born, you know, it's there are some infections that can get to the calf via the via via the cow and cause abortion or stillbirth. Um, and then once born, there, there is an array of other disease-causing agents out there, range, you know, kind of various bacteria that can cause joint ill and navel ill. Rotavirus and coronavirus would be the main viruses, and then some some parasites as well, such as coxie and cryptosporidium. Um, and also other agents, viruses and bacteria that can cause pneumonia. So there's a lot of different pathogens out there. And this slide kind of highlights gruesomely, um, and I apologize, but um, just the type of infections and diseases that these uh, infections can cause. And um, 
these are things that we see routinely through our post-mortem rooms. So um, things like joint till, scour for various reasons, meningitis, cases of, cases of pneumonia, and cases of navel ill. Um, I suppose it's, as well as these, these diseases can obviously cause death, but they can also cause, um, if they don't cause death, they can also cause quite a significant check in the growth of the calf, sometimes for the long term, um, and preventing you from, you know, kind of weaning that big calf that um, Tim was talking about the other night. Um, and they can also make them more susceptible to other diseases as well. So a calf with navel ill is already trying to fight off navel ill is, is perhaps more likely to go down with pneumonia. So I just want to talk first about the pre-calving period um, and the risk to the calf at this time. So the main, the most common causes of abortion in beef herds um, are infections that are picked up from the environment. So more specifically, infections that are picked up in in feed. So specifically, silage is the main culprit usually, and and also, but also water supplies as well. And it's quite important that you pay attention to what you put in front of late pregnant cows. Um, and the, the SREC in Dumfries, our colleague Heather Stevenson, did a nice little study a couple of years back. Um, and looking at, um, so she looked at five farms which had had problems with one of the most common causes of environmental, uh, one of the most common environmental causes of abortion called, caused by a bacteria called Bacillus. And, um, there were five farms are getting problems with this, and they they went out to farm and did a small study where they tested um, various types of of silage of different areas in the silage pits and different quality of silage and tested the water supplies and compared them to five other five control farms that hadn't had any problems with with abortion, and um, I think this this study showed um, quite clearly that. Um, there were huge amounts of bacteria to begin with to be found on on any spoiled or moldy or slimy silage to begin with. Um, so samples, this is quite severe examples, but but a, a, a huge numbers were, of bacteria were found on this type of silage compared to compared to cleaner silage. Um, the other thing was um, I'll come back to that in a second, but dirty water troughs, particularly the debris at the bottom of the water troughs, also contain huge numbers of uh, bacteria. Um, and the other areas that were co contained slightly higher bacteria than, than average were the sides and the top of the, of the pit silage as well. So I think that study I thought showed quite nicely that it's quite important you know to to feed the best possible silage you've got to late pregnant cows and to avoid feeding silage that is obviously moldy or or um slimy in appearance it might be from that study an idea to you know to, to be aware really of the top and the sides of the pit silage in particular and consider feeding that to young stock um another good idea is, is to clean away as well as any anything that hasn't been uneaten from you know before you add more silage um, and then finally with the water troughs to to pay attention to how clean they are and, and to, to give them a stir every so often and see how much debris there is at the bottom um, so it's a good idea to clean them out you know kind of periodically um, so moving on to the calf now after it is born um, and I'm assuming, I think in perhaps in it, I think in most cases, I think that um, the calf, I, whether you were, I think after the calf is whether you you calve in a group or whether you calve in individual, individual pens, but eventually the calf will be moved across with its mother to a pen of other calved cows. I think in an ideal situation, group calving, um, the calf would the cow would calve, calve down in the in a in the dry cow group and then either that same day or the day after would then be moved across to another pen with other calved cows and, and calves and and one benefit for that is, is you can feed them appropriately for a lactating cow um, um but, but to but to pre try and pre so to prevent disease in the calf after it is born, I think there is two key areas to think about. You've got the environment of the calf, 
and you've got calf immunity. So when I'm talking about calf immunity, I'm referring to colostrum, and I'll talk briefly about that at the end. Um, but my main focus is on going to be on managing the environment and managing the risk that the calf is at risk from in the environment. So the calf is at risk from the start, right from the very start, because it's born with very little antibodies and it relies on that first feeder colostrum to provide the antibodies to it. So the quicker it gets that feeder colostrum, the better. And then the cleaner the environment, the less chance there is of it picking up disease. Now, I think it's worth just pointing out that a lot of those infectious agents I was talking about at the start are actually are actually in the environment anyway, and and you cannot completely eliminate them. You know, they're added there. They're carried by adult cows. They're carried they're carried by older calves. You know, those those themselves do not become sick because they've got a strong enough immunity to it, and they're present at a low enough level as well as well but they are constantly passed you know in the dung and then they are constantly um present i suppose and you cannot completely eliminate them but you can control them and making life difficult for them to survive is what you want to try and achieve um and if your environmental conditions are not right you know there's more chance of these becoming a problem so for example here you know so for example too much moisture in the environment, if you've got wet bedding, if your ventilation is not up to scratch, then that's perfect for bacterial growth to survive, or for viruses to survive. If you've if your stocking density is too high, then um, that just increases the concentration of these um, bugs that can cause disease in the environment. If you've got older calves in the same group, they add quite significantly to um, the infectious load. And um, if you've got um, sick calves in the group as well, they're a big source. So I think there's six main points I want to make about how you can manage the environment. First of all, the, and I think most importantly, is the dry bedding at, at all times. And not, not only dry, dries and absorbs moisture, but it also forms, if you like, a, a barrier between the calf and the manure underneath. Um, Straw, I would say, is by far the best kind of bedding material, and it's probably better than anything for absorbency. Um, and plenty of straw is, is key, really. The second thing is ventilation, and I'm not going to go into too much depth on ventilation. There's quite a lot, a few um, good resources out there, and there, there are people who are far better than me on ventilation and shed design. Um, but what you're looking for is a constant, you know, low speed level of fresh air running through the shed at all times. Um, so that keeps the air clean, keeps the, keeps the air um, replaced, um, and that reduces your risk of pneumonia, but it also helps to dry out the shed as well, so that's quite key. The third thing is stocking rate. Um, avoid, try and avoid overstocking the pens as best you can, okay, you know, because the more, um, the more there are in one pen, you know, kind of the the higher the concentration really of these infectious bugs that can build up, um, and it's difficult and it's more difficult for the calves to find a or the cows as well to find um, a, a dry and clean area to lie on. So the fourth thing, and getting more specific now, is to try and keep um, the calves in as tight an age group as possible. Now, what I mean here is, is when the calves, when the calved cow and their calf are moved across into the calved cow pen with other calved cows, um, is to try and keep the calves that are in that pen, you know, in as tight an age range as possible. Um, and the reason for this is because older calves shed more infectious organisms but I have also got a really strong immunity as well. So even though they are carrying these organisms and um, passing them in, into the environment, they don't actually get sick themselves. A 24 hour or 48 hour old calf that you would add to that group would be at, um, has got a much weaker immune system, you know, and um, is 
is um, at risk of disease because that calf, because of the older calf shedding more of those infectious agents in the group. Keeping calves in a similar, in a tighter age range, age group, um, means that the level of immunity is similar throughout the group, and the amount of these bugs that they they shed into the environment is also similar. So you know, try and avoid having you know a calf which is a month or three weeks a month old, and a calf which is 24 to 24 to 48 hours old being in the same group. Try you know. Try and keep it as tight as you can, but if you can, you know, maybe a spread of a week to ten days would would be would be good. Um, the fifth point I want to make is is about a calf refuge. Now I'm not too sure. I'm sure many of you do know what this what I'm referring to here, but for for those who don't, then I want to show you this. So the the idea behind a calf refuge is that it's a dedicated lying area for the calf. So it's a it's a portion of the pen that's been apportioned out for the calf. So the the calf can go in and out of this pen at will, but the cow cannot go in. And um, there's various ways I suppose you can achieve this. Um, I suppose there may be like specialized gates, etc. You could you could put up, but a quick makeshift and effective um, solution is to put up a length of electric fence or electric tape across the pen. So for example, like, what's, like, like what um, is shown in this picture here. Um, and the benefits of this is that you can focus on keeping that calf refuge clean. You can bed it, in fact, you can add, you, know, you can keep it extra clean. You can add extra bedding to that, to that area. Um, the other benefit as well is you're only bedding that area. Well, you know, you're bedding the entire area, but you're only putting extra straw in that one area, um, which which means you can save on straw as well. So that's another benefit of it. Just make sure if you are putting a calf refuge up, I think it's important not to make it too small. You know, give them plenty of space, like there is in this picture here. If they're too tight together, I think you lose the benefits of it because they are. Um, Going to be congregating on top of each other, and and you're going to basically it's it's, it's not going to be um, there's going to be a build up of infectious organisms in in that area. So I think make sure you don't make it too small. And yeah, the idea. So this area here is green, so that would be considered low risk, and this area here would be red, so that would be considered a higher risk. You know. Um, and then the sixth point I want to make is, is I think it's important to consider is how you manage a sick calf. So I think it's important to remember that one sick calf is a massive source of contamination of the environment. Um, the amount that a, that a calf infected with a virus, for example, the amount of amplification of that virus that occurs in its gut and then passed out in its dung is huge. So. How, I think how you deal with a sick calf is really important. Um, and when you consider that this one calf can cause passive contamination of the bedding and increasing the pressure of disease onto the other calves, um, I think it's, it's really important and good advice to try and isolate the cow and the calf as promptly as possible. The earlier you can do it, the better to begin with. And this can be, you know, kind of a, a corner of a pen, for example, with two gates or um, or even better, a dedicated isolation facility. And um, I'm not entirely sure how many people would have this um, have the, for the ability to do this. But you know, if if there was um, a, a separate pe a separate building where you could put um, these sick animals, it would be ideal. The other thing I would recommend is is, is to test, particularly if the calf is scoured. So it's the collector fecal sample of a scouring calf would be. Um, and whether you test for it or whether you send it to the lab or not, um, is is useful just to collect the the a sample from a scouring calf as early as possible, and you're more likely to to pick up the causative agent in the early stages. Um, it's also important to collect the sample before you administer any treatments, especially antibiotics. So try and just get the sample before you start treatment. At least you've got it then. 
and I think the one important point there to make is that if you're collecting a sample, just be aware that some there are um, there are a few of these diseases that can actually infect and can cause quite nasty disease in people as well. So Salmonella, for example, Cryptosporidium, E. coli, they're all diseases that that can cause disease in humans. So so be careful. Wear gloves when you are collecting the sample. Um, then, so, so hopefully you've moved the cow and the calf out to a separate isolation area. It's a good idea to, to consider how much contamination of the bedding will, that will have been. You know, it's a good idea to maybe consider cleaning um, or mucking out that pen to just to reduce the load of of that um, of those uh, infection that is in the area, and maybe just close that pen then off to uh, any of the calves. And then finally, um, moving on to, so I mentioned at the start that the two main areas were to manage the environment and then secondly, to manage calf immunity. So in terms of managing calf immunity, I'm referring to colostrum. And we're going to talk more about colostrum on th Thursday next week. Um, but I just want to talk about one way of boosting your colostrum. And that is to, there is a vaccine available against rotavirus, coronavirus and E. coli called Rotavec and Corona. And I'm sure many of you do use this, but it is an option out there. It's not essential, and it's not a replacement for, you know, for for good colostrum management and good environmental hygiene. But it is one injection that you give three to twelve weeks before calving, um, and then the idea is, is that cow creates antibodies against these diseases, which are then passed to the colostrum, and then the calf receives those antibodies when it gets its first feed of colostrum. So it's important that the calf gets colostrum from the dam for that to work. So it's an option. Um, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's an option. So just to recap, seven points I want to 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 recap again. So um, watch we um, be aware of what you're putting in front of lay pregnant cows. You know, so avoid feeding spoiled silage. Um, Keep the water troughs clean. Dry bedding is paramount. Um, consider the idea of providing a calf refuge. Make sure you keep calves in as tight an age group as you can. Um, isolate sick animals early. And finally, um, consider vaccination as a way of boosting colostrum quality. Um, um, and yeah, so that's that's me coming to the end of my talk, slightly over 20 minutes, so I apologize. Um, but th yeah, thank you for logging on and listening. Um, and I'm more than happy to take any questions, but I'll hand over to, hand back to Robert now. So thank you. Thank you, Alwyn, for setting the bar pretty high there. So I'll try and not disappoint at this stage. Um, can everybody see this okay? Yes. Yes, thanks. Um, so looking at calving systems, looking at the system you've got, I think when we are looking at a system, so this is more like the full beef system, what is it that we're trying to achieve? So similar on your own farms is similar to what we are trying to achieve with this project. We're trying to wean more calves or trying to produce more live calves born per 100 cows. And we're trying to produce more kilo kilograms of beef weaned at the end of the year as well. So that's that's what we're trying to do. With that, we're trying to make more money. That's the result. But because of that, we're reducing fixed costs. So labour eh, is being reduced and people are having to run more cows with less labour units. So that's a challenge. And um, really, when we look at that, we have to look at these things and step back and see, is what you're hoping to achieve from your beef system, is your calving system fit to actually achieve that? So in the short term, looking at the herd you've got, you so if you want to improve performance on last year, it's likely that you're going to need to improve overall herd management, but also perhaps intervene a bit more as well. So that's in the short term, while in the longer term, we're hoping to, or personally, I think we need to be breeding more self-sufficient cows, so cows that are more capable of a calving down themselves and something that we're more able to treat as a herd rather than as an individual. Um, but certainly in, in the in the short term and in short and medium term, there is a, a, a definite need for intervention and, and ways of doing that safely. So we're going to look at that in a wee bit more detail later on. But 
at this stage, I think it's important for all beef businesses to look at look at what they're doing and is it is it working for you? Is it doing what what you need it to do? And questions that come into my mind are things like: Are you calving at the right time? Are you calving too early and putting a lot of pressure on on your system, on your housing, and on certainly on environmental disease as well? And is there opportunities for some people for outdoor calving? You see, for autumn calvers anyway, outdoor calving works well. And is there scope to incorporate a slightly later spring calving, or, or you know, what else can we do? And really, that would be one. It's a good discussion to have on a one-to-one -one basis uh, with friends, colleagues, consultants, whoever it is. But have that discussion, challenge your challenge your system, and and see if it's if it's fit for purpose. But back to proper calving systems so focusing entirely on the calving system um with recently there's been a lot of the advances in technology and things have become a lot cheaper so we've seen an uptake a significant uptake in, in calving cameras and sensors so the sensors to me cameras and sensors work hand in hand the sensors were probably here first um, or were getting widely used first and we know mucol and, and other products are out there um, that are working really well but to me, those products are, are best suited really to the shoulders of the season, to those early calving cows, and certainly the ones later on in the calving period, because we know you're more likely to die as a calf if you're born at the tail end of the calving, uh, calving period. And that's really down to us being, um, you know, we take our eye off the ball, we move on to spring work, uh, and we've done well for the majority and, and, and sometimes we let the, the minority down. So those calving sensors are really good for those late calving cows. And certainly the camera is a I think it's a real revolution or a camera system is a great thing to incorporate into into your system. It allows remote monitoring and, and close remote monitoring in, in great detail now with the cameras that we've got. And the reality we need to keep in our mind is that cows actually want to do this themselves. It's a natural process and they don't really want us intervening and, and ideally they don't need us to intervene as well. So, but we know monitoring is the way we can ensure that, that we can ensure success and intervene at the right time. So cameras allow us to re remotely monitor. And actually what I've found really interesting with my, I have one camera at home and I find it really interesting to watch a cow having a normal calving. And that calving is actually pretty different to the calving that she would have if I was leaning over a gate watching her. You know, she's always got one eye, eye on you if you're there, whereas what she does uh, in her own time is a bit different. So it's a, you know, it's an interesting process and something we can all learn from. The camera really for me is something that ensures that I can be here rather than here. Um, I should credit um, reference Benson's for beds off of Google for the bed photograph but um, really you know I think through calving time probably from a um, well-being point of view we get we get little enough sleep as it is and if we are able to monitor uh, by waking up checking and going back to sleep you know I think that's all well and good. Another area we don't discuss very often when it comes to, cam to calving cameras is the importance of sound and I think if you can, if you're developing a, a system and investing in a camera system, I would really encourage you to invest in one that does incorporate sound. Um, I know, speaking to many people, that they'll intervene more often based on what they hear rather than what they see. So certainly, if you're going to invest the money, invest the money and, and uh, get, the, get the best systems you can. Other areas and, and other key things, investment opportunities really are, uh, to me, a calving gate. So a calving gate is something that's evolved over time. It's, you know, probably evolved from squeezing a cow behind a gate uh, and it's evolved into an integrated gate and yoke system. And many of you all, all know these, have these and appreciate these as well. But for those of you that don't, to me, I think it's a hugely important tool, both from a health and safety point of view, particularly from a health and safety point of view, but also if something's easy, it then generally goes on to get done. So the calving gate often is, is probably used more often as a suckling gate, as a, as a calving gate, but it gives us so much, so many more options um, to handle and deal with individual or, or cow and calf yokes. And it's something basically for the sake of your herd, for your vet and for your own safety. If you've not got one, I would strongly advise that you go out and get one. 
uh, and it will it will make a big difference to your uh, performance. Basically, you'll spend between probably 350 and 600 pounds. So the one calf that you save in the first year of having that calving gate um, will will pay for a gate that will be there for 25, 30 years without any any major issues. But when I was writing about calving gates, I did start thinking about calving pens. And what, what I was thinking is basically, do we do we need to move every cow and calf? And there's now there's quite a lot of evidence out there to say that we're actually probably doing more harm than good by putting cows into individual pens. You know, we know from lambing sheep in sheds that a sheep will lamb, we then go and put her in an, in an individual pen, create a lot of work, but do quite a good job for her. But for cows, actually, they you know they have this the calving site that they, they get they get in mind where they're going to calve quite a long time before they actually start the calving process. And if we go in at the very start of the calving process, we can actually stop the calving or, or make it, you know, slow down that calving and, and put the calf at, at greater risk. Um, so really, you know, for the majority, I think we should be calving or aiming to calve in group pens, uh, where it would be the least stressful for, certainly for the cow, but also for the for the handler. You know, if, if we can let her get on with it in her own time, in her own space where she's comfortable, um, we're all in a better place but if we, we obviously we do there are going to be those individuals who need assistance or who the the calf then needs assistance to suckle and we need somewhere to go with that and the key i think is to have calving pens dedicated calving pens that are set up either in or close to the, the actual group calving pen so that it's not a three-day camel trek round about the steading to get to where you you can actually handle that animal. You've got something, uh, hopefully, with an incorporated calving gate where you can actually make a difference to that uh, to that animal really quite easily. Uh, Alan mentioned about sick calves and and perhaps deferring. You know, if you've had a sick calf in a pen, uh, not putting calves in there until it's been washed out. And I think certainly in the calving pen situation, it should never be used as a sick bay or an isolation facility. Uh, it should be a dedicated calving pen, and, and ideally, it should be easily cleaned and uh, you know well strawed between well strawed and disinfected between uh, occupants. So that's the importance of the calving pen. But really, a reminder, and I, I make no apology for this, really, that um, your safety has to come first when it comes to calving cows. Every cow on your farm is dangerous. And sadly, we're losing, on average, we, there's, there's two people die every year based on incidents at or around calving time. And to me, that's, that's certainly too, too many. And there's also all the pe other people who have close shaves or, or significant injuries as well. So we need to keep that in mind that these are they're, they're animals that are generally, they're 10 times the weight of us. And, and they, they think they've got a job to do protecting their calf and, and we shouldn't take any chances. Most of the incidents that do happen with cows are, are with the ones that you, uh, they're normally quiet. They don't, they don't, um, they've never really caused a problem before. You've trusted them and you've made, you, you know, you've made a mistake. Um, so, you know, develop, developing safe and effective calving systems, I think, is about the most important thing we can do uh, in the next, you know, in the, in the coming weeks. A pre calving assuming you're you're a february march calving a developing your system making slight alterations to your system a, to save you and make things you know make things a lot safer is really important the one thing to do is is calling hard on temperament so that's obviously in the short term we can make changes to the system but in the long term we can make significant improvements to temperament by culling um, I've put in a YouTube link here, which is actually from uh, it's Basil Lohman has a short video, and it's a really, really good video on um, safety, health and safety at calving time, and, and those tweaks and things you can make to your system, ideas, simple, cheap things that you can do that might might land up saving your life. So well worth watching, uh, and when these slides are shared, you can, you can have a look at it. Um, it takes about it's five or six minutes long. It's not a big video, and it, as I say, it's very, very important. I think that we all get our head around what's a, those wee things that we can do. I should probably point out that that is not Basil down below. That is a bullfighter. Um, but just looking at cow temperament, a, some work done by Simon Turner and, and others at SRUC has, has shown quite clearly that angry cows, although it looks as if they're doing a good job and they're better mothers, they're actually not. Um, they are 
we often hear about the cow that's just been a bit motherly or she calms down after a few days. She's really not worth a running the risk you know she's actually doing a worse job so flightiness is is heritable so if your if your mother was flighty there's a, a big chance that you're going to be flighty too um and those calves then go on to have lower birth weights and lower growth rates so you can see on the graph on the right hand side that those cows that are quiet in the pre-calving and around calving period actually perform better as far as output of beef uh, goes con compared to those that are angrier. You can see there's outliers, there always are outliers, but on the whole, the trend is uh, not in favour of keeping angry cows. And if we think about the, the process, what's happening, so that cow, if, assuming so she thinks she's a wild animal, um, and basically that natural process, her stress hormone, so if she's stressed in mid-pregnancy, she passes stress hormones across her uh, placenta and that tunes her calf up, tunes up that um, fight or flight response and means that the calf would be born, born fit to deal with the same stressful environment that the cow's in. So that cow that is constantly stressed, jumping gates, causing problems, putting you at risk, is likely, very likely to have calves that then go on to do the same. We're now running more cows per labour unit. I said that before, but with more cows per labour unit, we're getting more mechanised. There's less human interaction and these ladies are becoming, we're getting worse rather than better. So good culling decisions are, are really, really important in this case. And to be honest, I don't, I don't think there's any room for second chances. I think if there's, if there's animals that aren't, aren't performing, aren't behaving the way they should be, there should be no excuses and, and um, get them out of the herd. And, ex and in, in extreme cases, you might then look at heifers and, and daughters within the herd as well and see, to do, see whether you should do the same with them. So the one thing, I'm just looking at three basically key points of, of things that we should be doing soon pre-calving. And that's the first one is your mobile phone. So I think the mobile phone is the most important tool of all the tools we've got for calving cows. Uh, one, you know, you, you've got a, a great place to store data, whether that's a photograph or into a, into a program. Two, you've got a, a ideal way of getting a advice or information from websites or contacting your vet and discussing with them. But the most important one, a, without a doubt, is the health and safety aspect of it. If it's in your pocket, it can save your life, but it'll only save your life, as I say, it'll only save your life if it's in your pocket, if it's charged and if it's got reception. So we need to, for those of us who are calving cows, we need to make sure all of those three things are, are ticked. And for those of us who have a, other people within the team or elderly relatives or others involved, we should make sure that they're the same. And those three things, if, if, if your phone doesn't tick all three of those boxes, it's not going to be any good to you. The reception part is really quite interesting, and I think it's a thing you can do tomorrow morning. You know, you can go for a wander and look at where, where you're working with cows, where your you know, routine handlings are, and just make sure that there's actually phone reception in those areas. The next one is the, is the calving jack. So, Generally, the, the celebration of the end of calving is that you throw the calving, calving aid to the side and the next time you see it is next year's calving. So again, tomorrow, I would go and find it, check it. Is it in good shape? Is, it, is, it, is everything in working order? What are the ropes like? You know, Are the ropes dry or are the ropes uh, freely moving still as they should be? And actually, it's probably quite good practice to go and buy a new set of ropes. There'll be you know they'll be they'll be clean. They're they're good to go, and it never does any harm to have a spare in the in the in the cupboard anyway. And the key point is, hopefully you don't need it, but certainly when you do need it, you generally need it pretty quick. So it's a good a good option for tomorrow is to go and, and dig that out and make sure everything's in order. And then the last one, and I I don't want to finish on a on a low and finish sounding like the. BBC News, but COVID is a, obviously a, a huge part of all our, all our lives at the moment, and, and this year's calving is going to be different to any other calving, perhaps with the exception of last year. We are, as farmers, in quite a fortunate position that we're um, we are remote, we're, we're rural, we're isolated, and we don't we don't see that many people in a day. So I'm not scaremongering here, but the question I'd, again I'd like you to ask yourself is what happens if there was a COVID outbreak at calving time? So if somebody in your team or, or you yourself 
had a you know tested positive and had to isolate what would happen the answer probably without a bit of planning is the whole thing falls to bits so we need to and, and there's probably no silver bullet here either but i just really want to raise awareness here that we need to think about it and we don't we can't just assume that it'll all be okay i think it's worth having a plan sitting around the table with family speaking to neighbors and speaking to friends about um you know what 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 would happen what can be done and the reality is when you have that conversation with neighbors it's possibly that you, you're going to go and help them rather than they're coming to help you but having a plan having something in place is really really important um as i say don't assume it'll be okay talk about it write things down i think as far as record keeping goes this year is the most important probably that we've ever had make use of whiteboards make use of whatsapp and, and and certainly make use of some of the many emergency plans that are available the one i've highlighted there is the farm advisory service one which is free um it's out there and it's there to be used and i would encourage everyone to use it and the beauty of this type of planning is you know hopefully it's not needed and actually it's there in the event of another issue down the line so it's it's good forward planning and as far as data gathering goes, likes of whiteboards and things are actually can be very useful for your own use as well. So once we get to the end of calving, it's not all been a waste of time as well. So do take COVID seriously um, and and try and make some form of a plan to um, to make sure that this is a successful calving. And the last point I put in red is we know now at the moment with with Brexit, COVID, and all that's happening, not everything's guaranteed. So don't wait until the last minute to go and get all your supplies that you need for calving. Now we're probably, again, assuming that that's a, a we're a few weeks off calving. Um, now is a good time to go through what you've got, double check, and go and get what you need. Uh, go and go and get lube, new ropes, whatever else you're needing. Make sure you've got it, and don't be disappointed. So that's basically a, a few a few points of discussion and pretty much brings me to the end of what I was going to say. Um, just before we, we go into questions, and I think we've got we've got a good bit of time for questions, I would just highlight again that we're back on next Tuesday. So we've got Tuesday, Thursday, and then Tuesday again for the spring series. So we're going to be looking at a uh, bull management uh, prior to bulling. And then on the Thursday, we're looking at assistance and antibodies. So actually getting in and calving that cow and, and making sure we get enough colostrum on board. So that's what's coming. And with that, I would thank you for listening to our presentations and then encourage any questions to come forward. Thank you, Robert, and, and thank you, Alwyn, for two, uh, two excellent presentations and, and, and both of you keeping very well to time putting Karen and myself to shame from Tuesday that they, but, but that gives us a, a great opportunity now to have some have some questions and, and thanks very much to the folk uh, that have pinged some into the, the chat group here I get to fire these questions now uh, which is fantastic because I don't need to worry about answering them um, and there's some suited to each of you so, so nobody's off the hook um, but I you, you can still type in if you have more questions we're, we're, we'll, we'll try and get through just as many as we can in the next 15 minutes um, <clears throat> the first one then to Alwyn is around water troughs. So there was a couple on this actually. Um, so is there a danger to stirring up a water trough that you you bring the bugs you bring the bugs out the system and make it worse? And if we're going to sterilise, do we need to sterilise those water troughs um, after you clean them out? And if so, what's the what's the best way to do that in a, in a shed that's got stock in stock in the in the building? I. I I think the idea of, of stirring it is to um, just get an idea of how much debris is at the bottom. And from that study, I think most of the bacteria was found in the debris at the bottom. So if, if there is a slightly, I see the I see the point. If, if you're going to stir it, then you're going to kind of add it, you know, you're going to spread it around in the water. So I see that point. Um, I, in terms of, I think in terms of cleaning them out, I think it's just a case of you know emptying them and maybe pressure washing them, and I think that should suffice. I don't think you need to go as far as as, as disinfect and sterilize. I think a, a thorough clean is good enough. Um, 
Great. It, uh, it's, a, yeah. it's a physical removal job, m yes. more than a sterilising and disinfecting yeah. through header turns yes. or anything like that. Yeah. Unless you've got something particularly nasty coming through the system, which is very unusual. This is just physical removal. Um, Karen or Robert, anything to add on, on water cleanliness and how, how to do that practically? I would just probably go back to the, you know, the looking at the whole system and, and again setting things up so that, that it's easily done. You look at those uh, dairy examples where you've got tipping troughs or or like slurry couplings on the bottom that you can easily totally flush it out, brush it out, plug it back in, and you know if it's easy, it happens, and if it's tough, I know you go to the smaller water troughs and and more of them, and it becomes a harder job really to do that. Um, that really what you do this year to make sure it's clean is one thing and actually looking to develop that system it's probably not that dear a job to go and invest in some new trucks that are actually easier to do yeah make it easy make, make it easy thank you robert yeah if, if, if at all possible the easier it is the more regularly we'll do it and the more regularly we do it the lower the risk uh, the lower the risk gets good okay karen you're also, not um, oh yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. Go on. i was just going to say i think there's also an argument as well if you know if this feed close to the water trough you can build sides up on you know of, of onto the side where so less feed goes in or you know there's ways around keeping them a bit cleaner as well so often you see a lot of feed mm. going in um, and i think kind of just simple weldings of of bits on the side can can also make a difference fantastic thank you karen brilliant um Karen, a question then for yourself. This was around ventilation. We talked about air quality and the importance, um, particularly in pneumonia. Um, if we know that we have substandard ventilation, we feel we, that we can't get that improved at least this year. What merit is there in in the in the feed blocks and various additives that are sort of designed to improve the improve the air intake by the animal uh, under various names? All right. So like a like a, a eucalyptus is the type bucket or something. I think like, so. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. I think um, that they're definitely not a replacement for good ventilation and good hygiene. Um, I think I sometimes like to look at it as a um, like a human being that's got the cold and it would help you breathe more easily, but it's not going to um, make bugs go away, I don't think, um, or, um, or, or replace ventilation. So I think as long as the animal, you know, if they've got substandard ventilation, as long as they've got good nutrition, their mineral and trace elements are being met, then that'll give them the best chance of fighting infection. Um, I don't know if Alwyn wants to comment on that um, at all. Yeah, I, I doubt if they'll have much impact at all to be honest with you so yeah i think it does it's no replacement for good ventilation at all so it might make them feel a bit better <laughs> so. yeah there, there there are very very few sheds that cannot be improved even if we have to go to mechanical positive pressure ventilation which which is the fan and sock mm. there's very few sheds that can't be improved at all um, Albeit the, the 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 money needed to do it can vary, but um, ventilation can can always be improved. Um, but it, but it should be done, uh, you know, with with, with proper advice. Um, excellent, Robert. Uh, calving gates were discussed, and there's another one just come in about uh, catching crates, which I think is slightly different. But the first question I thought was a good one. Um, suckling a calf, so the calving's done, but the calf's not suckling, and we dealt with a question on that on Tuesday. Is the calving gate the bit of kit you want then, or are you better off in the crush? Is it safer in the crush for that job? I think, I mean, suckling, so calving a cow in a crush um, isn't ideal, but certainly suckling a calf in a crush I have no issue with at all. It's just quite often where that cow is and where the crush is, there's a bit of a, you know, the bit of travel, there's a bit of hassle that goes, that goes in there. And actually, because you can bring the big gate round, chain it round and open the wee gate, you can be equally safe in the calving gate scenario as you are in the crush so i wouldn't discount either of them but i think a you know for, certainly from from speaking to multiple people with calving gates the things that they use them for most routinely is actually suckling calves um, and that's possibly due to them suckling more calves than they actually calve cows if that if that makes sense um yeah 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 but yeah I, I, I you're supposed to Aye, and if you've already moved your cow there, then it's one less movement, isn't it? It's one less hassle to shift it to somewhere else to get to a crush if, if you can use that gate for a second. And at that point, you're also trying to build up that bond. You're trying to make, you know, cow and calf, you do want some love in there. And, and I don't think we want to, if we can minimise the, the amount of intervening we're doing, great. And if, if that means, you know, firing in, in a calving pen with a calving gate, 
brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I, I, I'm conscious of numbers, so I'm going to I'm going to move on again. Um, this one will come back to yourself, Alwyn. I'm going to combine two as well. I hope that's all right. But uh, uh, a couple of folk talking about re recurrent problems with crypto and recurrent problems with Coxie, and they try and take care mm. of hygiene as best as they can. Is there anything in addition they can do? So, so I think they've, they, you know, they're they're paying attention to hygiene, um, but finding recurrent problems and what can be done additionally, or what else should they be thinking about in terms of prevention? So one thing with crypto and Coxie is that they've got um, the eggs are very resistant in the environment. So that's and can persist in pens from year to year. So they can stick to walls, you know, can stick to the walls and to the to the to the pens. And I think it's shown that routine disinfectants. So if you're talking about FAM30 or Vercon and stuff like that, are not 100% against. Uh, well, don't hundred percent um kill all those um eggs if you like, and those stages and if you are having recurrent problems with crypto or coxie, it's worth um probably before probably in the summer actually you know before you house the cattle is to try and clean and i, I it's important to clean the place first as well because um you can't disinfect kind of you know you, you, you can the disinfectant cannot penetrate that well into kind of um soil data so you need to clean the area first and then disinfect with more kind of specialized disinfectants and quite a lot of these contain like peroxide type disinfectants um and there's a list of them actually there's four that are um mentioned um in some in various documents that that are, are available and maybe we can put the list on online um Robert, maybe you can add that list on. Yep. So that that's one thing is to, is to consider cleaning and disinfecting the shed with that, just trying to move those eggs that are um, surviving from year to year. Um, and in terms of during the season and controlling coxie uh, and crypto, it's it's a tough one, and and um, there are more specific treatments for um, crypto, like Halicure is one you can use for crypto. Um, if you if you do diagnose a problem, you can you can treat them, and you can you know you can you can treat the calf that is sick, or you can actually use it as a as a prophylactic, as a preventative thing as well. Um, it's you know it's it's quite a nasty drug. To be fair, um, it is you've got to be careful with uh, the dosage because you can overdose quite easily, um, and it's not cheap. Um, but that's another option in in terms of controlling crypto anyway. Um, but but the, you know kind of maintaining environmental hygiene and keeping the stock density low is is just as important really if if anything if if more. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you, Alwyn. I so so getting rid of organic matter, getting rid of the dung, first and mm. foremost, checking your disinfectant is is effective because you know there's not that many that are, and we'll get that list sent out, um, and then speaking to your vet about specific products um, that can be used mm. essentially in the face of an outbreak or, or when there is known to be an extremely an extremely high risk. Um, excellent, mm. thank you. Um, Karen, we've one here on temperament. There was a, there was a, a good bit talked about temperament now, and can mineral uh, can mineral deficiencies uh, cause a temperament issue in our cattle? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know, other than perhaps if they were short of magnesium and they were kind of in that frenzy. Um, um, I, I honestly don't know, to be honest. Uh, that would uh, unless it was it was due to something that was um you know causing them uh, nervousness or tremors or something but i don't know if you've got any <laughs> thoughts on that tim or alwyn either but um but i would think unlikely mm. unless it was that kind of situation no i i would agree i had thought the same thing i was thinking magnesium mm. you know the, the the most likely and as you say on the fringes because they, they usually go down quite quickly unfortunately and um mm. sometimes even spiking a high fever when they're toxic they can the the temperament can change but it's a very very temporary and very severe change rather than the cow that you kind of always know that you need to watch around calving time which i think was more uh robert you know that, that that's really the ones you were thinking of that Mm -hmm. The one that hits the crust gate and doesn't stop running until you let her go again, the running yeah. on the spot kind of cow, she's not, nothing to do with minerals yeah. or 
or diet. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And 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 the the impact on growth. I re, I really enjoyed that, and and it brought to mind a study which I had looked at recently. Which I sorry, I'm going to ping this one in, but it's just to hammer home the point on temperament. This this was a, a study done in, in in Australia, and just around the year 2000, they stuck 12 poor temperaments of wild cattle and 12 good temperament cattle into a feedlot uh, to see if it had an effect on respiratory disease. But, uh, the, the same the same issue Robert referred to, high cortisol increasing susceptibility to pneumonia. And it appeared it did. None of the 12 calm cattle got sick, sick and five of the 12 wild cattle got sick, but only one of them was through pneumonia. Two of them just got themselves so stressed they stopped eating with no no apparent reason, and the other two kicked themselves, uh, kicked themselves or kicked the equipment and ended up lame in the in, in the pen. So th these these animals, once they leave your place uh, in, in the integrated system, still causes more problems down the line. Uh, anyway, I wanted to share that on. Um, good feeding old silage. So I think this was really about old silage. So this is silage that's run round a year rather than silage that's mm. necessarily spoiled. Is that a risk? And is there a time in the pregnancy? Maybe is that a risk, Alwyn, to you and, and Karen? Is there a time in the pregnancy when you can feed that safely? Um, I'm not 100% sure. I think if it's been looked after all right over the winter, you know, and to the next year, I think it should still be okay um, to feed that. Although I would, you know, in, in late pregnancy, you know, you're talking the last couple of months, I would still probably avoid feeding that. Um, what do you think, Karen? Yeah, I think as long as it's been preserved well and it's sealed yeah. well and there's no moulds, I think it should be fine. Um, and if you've got it there and you need to use it up, um, you know, possibly earlier in the pregnancy and say old straw should be fine as well as long as it's been stored well and it's mm. been taken well as well. So it's not, you know, um, damp or mouldy when it was when it was harvest uh, harvest time. So I think as long as there's, you know, they've been stored well and kept well, um, I don't see too many issues. But as you said, probably safer to do it in earlier pregnancy rather than the last few months. Um, but I do know some people who have second year silage that are feeding it now, you know, coming up to Cavan because they've not got anything else. So, I mean, that's, um, yeah, you, you have to just do what you've got sometimes. But as, as you were saying earlier, just avoid the mouldy bits and make sure it's well preserved and it's, you know, semi-decent stuff. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you both. Excellent. Um, we are just coming up to time. I do have one last uh, difficult question. And, and Robert, you appear to have gotten off lately tonight, so I'm going to bring this one to you. Uh, I, I am currently calving in April, but what is the best time for calving to generate the best calves? So I think that uh, comes back to your when, when should we be calving point. Uh, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, it is a, a good question and one we could probably talk about for a full webinar series, I think. Um, so the thing the most important bit is that when suits you. So when suits you and when suits your farm. Uh, to me, I, I would go to the, I went to the school of calving to suit your grass growth so that you've actually, you're turning out to, to good quality grass. You're bulling on the cheapest and best feed that we've got. Um, April calving probably would suit that. You know, a March April calving would, would fall into that bracket. However, there's examples of people successfully calving on, on every month of the year. Um, for a Probably for a simple, cheap system, I would think the system you're on at about March, April calving, it, traditional spring calving would be a pretty well the, the place to go. The, and the question, I think, to, the full question was to get the best calf. Now, to me, that's it's, it's an approach to get the best calves important, but it's actually my approach would be to get the most money. Um, you know, so where, where can we have the lowest cost system to actually, so possibly producing a weaned calf born in April, uh, or, or born in April and, and weaned and sold off its mother in October, November, is a better job than spending a lot of money on a calf that's born in January to sell, sell it slightly bigger. The costs are higher than the income. So. I would, I would maybe try and change the mindset a wee bit and, and focus on, on what the profitability would be rather than on what the, the best calf would be. Good man, Robert, thank you can I, very can much. I just add, um, can I just add as please. well, um, it yeah. just, just from what I was talk, talking about, I think the quicker you can get him out to grass, 
the better, really. Yeah. So less time they spend in the shed is good. <laughs> Thank so, you, Alan. And, no. and actually, that, that's very helpful because there was a point on that. Uh, does an outdoor calving linking to this, the last question? Does an outdoor calving deal with all of these issues, the the, 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 the very many issues that you you refer to? And essentially, I think we're answering that question, saying yet yeah, to, to a large extent it can uh, yeah. and, and does. Wonderful. Okay, I am hugely grateful. There is a stack of questions here. There are a stack of questions here. I wonder, I know we haven't got through them all, which I'm conscious of, and that's a shame. Um, we may try and ping written answers. I'm sorry, I'm committing you three now. <laughs> You're all nodding. There's we'll four of us, ping... <laughs> Yeah, is there? <laughs> we'll ping written answers to those that have, have sent us uh, uh, good questions, and, and we'll try and get something back to you. So my apologies, we didn't get them all aired, um, but I think it's important we run these things to time. So I will pass back to yourself, Robert to close. Yep, uh, the other thing we'll do, probably some of those good questions is maybe we'll maybe try and drag them into, if there's time on Tuesday, we'll maybe try and, and air some of them then, uh, at that point too. So basically with that, as you see, Tim, we're, we're just over time. So uh, just quickly to sum up, a uh, thank you to a uh, set of the panel for tonight, uh, the backroom staff as well, uh, UIF for funding it, and also to you, the audience, for coming along. I hope this is doing what you need it to do. And at this stage, I would be, I would welcome, we're not doing formal feedback until the end of the, the fifth, so at the end of the spring, end of the series, but if there are points you want to make uh, as to what you want to see more of or less of, uh, do feel free to ping me a wee email. My email's on the, the slides from yesterday, which um, or some Tuesday, uh, which you'll be able to get. Um, so yeah, let us know what you're thinking, keep us posted, and hopefully we'll see as many of you as possible on Tuesday. So with that, all the best. Thank you very much and good evening.